Excellent. Good evening, Father Tom Saphiris here from the uh, Cathedral of the Glorious Ascension in Oakland, California, coming from my home office. We are uh, continuing our discussion, our journey, our pilgrimage to Pascha. It's getting so close now, and uh, it's a very, very special time of the year, very, very special time of the year. And one of the things that we try and do in the church is, is sanctify time. What do we mean by that? That we set aside moments, minutes, hours, days, um, so that we can reflect upon the good things that God has done for us, sanctifying time. And time is a very human thing. God does not exist in time, but we do. And we're taking some of that very, very precious time and dedicating it to our God. And that's what we do with the services and the celebrations of the church. So, uh, again, in, in this time of the year is extremely, extremely blessed in that we are growing closer, closer and closer to uh, the end of Great Lent, the beginning of uh, Holy Week and uh, celebration of our Lord's crucifixion and his resurrection we'll open up with two prayers as i told you last week we're reading from the psalm of the sense these psalms uh, starting with psalm number 119 were psalms that were sung by the by the uh, uh, by the jews as they ascended up to jerusalem uh and we can envision this that on their pascha on their passover when thousands of people returned to jerusalem they were going up to uh to Jerusalem singing these hymns as they traveled and to my good friend Phil in in uh in in Pittsburgh God bless you good to to see you're with us in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit amen I was glad when they said to me let us go into the house of the Lord our feet were standing in your courts O Jerusalem Jerusalem built as a city shared by all for there the tribes went up the tribes of the Lord a testimony for Israel to give thanks to the name of the Lord. For their thrones were set for judgment, thrones over the house of David. Ask then for the things which are for Jerusalem's peace and prosperity for those who love you. May there be peace then in your power and prosperity in your citadels. For the sake of my brethren and neighbors, I have spoken peace concerning you. For the sake of the house of the Lord our God, have I sought good things for you. Amen. And now the Latin prayer of St. Ephraim the Syrian, O Lord and Master of my life, take from me the spirit of sloth, meddling, lust of power, and idle talk, but give rather the spirit of chastity, humility, patience, and love to your servant. Yea, O Lord and King, grant me to sin my own sins and not judge my brother. You are blessed unto the ages of ages. Amen. Again, good evening, good afternoon, and uh, we're going to plunge into our our studies on to our journey of great pilgrimage of great Lent this coming uh, this coming week we will be celebrating the fifth Sunday of Great Lent. Great Lent that Sunday, of course, is dedicated to Saint Mary of Egypt, and we're going to be very very blessed at least here in Oakland, we have a wonderful parishioner, uh, Christina Gindi, who a uh, student from Harvard, a uh, family therapist, uh, studied, uh, uh, did religious studies at Harvard, will give us an amazing presentation on the uh, life of St. Mary of Egypt. And how do I know that? She did this for us about eight or nine years ago, and she has since uh, um, revised it. And she did just a beautiful job, so I'm sure it's going to be very, very good. I'm not promising anything. Uh, I'm going to try and record it, and maybe we can get that posted at another time. But that's a whole other story. So we have uh, St. Mary of Egypt. That's Sunday, what, the 21st. The following weekend is Saturday of Lazarus and Palm Sunday. The uh, Great Lent ends on Friday night, a week, two week, uh, a week from... Uh, uh, this Friday night, uh, and then Saturday of Lazarus, 
Palm Sunday, not part of Great Lent. Great Lent ends that Friday night and not part of Holy Week. Saturday stands by itself, in a sense, as the Sunday. And then Sunday evening, we start into Holy Week. So we're on this. And if you include the, the week of cheese fair or the week of meat fair where we stopped eating meat, uh, we will have, by the time we get to the resurrection of our Lord, Savior, Jesus Christ, we will have had 54 days of very, very specific focus in on the uh, on the journey pilgrimage to Pascha. And then if you go back a few more weeks than that, it's almost 75 days, and if you include the pre Lenten period of time. So this has been a beautiful and very, very joyful and a very, very focused uh journey and pilgrimage just a little review of what we're doing or what the church has done over the past several weeks and what we're doing for the next couple the purpose the original purpose of great lent was to prepare catechumens for baptism and this actually is happening in many parishes throughout the orthodox world especially in this country, we have a lot of uh, parishes that are receiving a number of converts. And that has kind of been a restoration because about, who knows, several hundred years ago, maybe a thousand years ago, I can't really know, I don't really know the uh, the time frame, the, the shift of preparing people for baptism uh, took place from that to this sense of renewal, this sense of repentance, this metania. The church was not receiving hundreds and thousands of converts every year as it did in the early years. So now the church kind of adjusted its thinking, adjusted its rhetoric, if you will, towards uh, repentance and metania. This Repentance, this metania, helps to put us in the proper frame of mind, the proper mindset, and if we can coin a phrase, the, the proper soul set, to better celebrate, to better benefit from, to better experience the passion and resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So entering the final week of Lent, and as we push to live Holy Week, as we try to go inward to allow the experience to be alive in us, to experience Holy Week and the passion of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And we're not talking about some sort of emotional experience but we're talking about something that much, much deeper, an integration of our faith deep within us, a, an experience. And not, again, an emotional experience, but a deep spiritual experience of what our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ does for us. To not only understand, but to become one with our Lord who died and was resurrected for us. So the goal of, of all this effort that we have put into this pilgrimage, the Holy Week and, and to Pascha, is to help elevate us and to be open to the message that will be communicated of what our Lord did for us and what he still does for us. And we'll talk about this a little bit next week that, uh, there's always this, uh, uh, if you will, poetic license that the church takes, but it's an expression of the truth that uh, today something takes place. Today, Simeron Kremata, today is hung upon the cross. He was suspended earth among the waters from Holy Thursday night. There's this sense of what Christ did 2,000 years ago still impacts today. And it's not a feeling, it's, it's, it's the truth. What Christ did 2,000 years ago still impacts humanity today, still can be experienced, still can have a presence and must have a presence in our lives. 
So we're not just talking about history or historical facts or a historical event, which it was that happened in our history, but that event impacts humans to this day. Like it happened just for us. When we go to experience Holy Thursday and Good Friday and the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, that resurrection is happening for us right now. And uh, it is a very, very powerful, powerful event. To get to the fifth Sunday of Lent, I want to focus in on the gospel and epistle lesson that will be read on Sunday morning, uh, April 21, 2024. It'll, it's going to help us better understand, if you will, this final push into um, into the uh, celebration of, of the fifth Sunday of Lent. So the, uh, the gospel lesson, like most of the gospel lessons during the Sundays of Lent, many of the Saturdays, is taken from the Gospel of Mark, and it's Mark 10, 32 through 45. I'm going to read it to you, and then we're going to talk about that, and then we're going to come to the, uh, the epistle lesson. So begins, and they were on the road going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was walking ahead of them, and they were amazed, and those who followed were afraid, amazed and afraid. And taking the twelve again, he began to tell them what was to happen to him, saying, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him to the Gentiles, and they will mock him and spit upon him and scourge him and kill him, and after three days he will rise. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came forward to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit one at your right hand and one at your left in your glory. But Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or to be baptized with the baptize, baptism with which I baptize? And they said to him, We are able. And Jesus said to them, The cup that I drink you will drink. And with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those who whom it has been prepared. And when the ten heard it, they became indignant at James and John. And Jesus called them to him, and he said to them, You know that those who are supposed to rule over the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great men exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must first be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be the slave of all. For the Son of Man also came not to to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And um, that story, that uh, encounter, leads up to um, the healing of a blind man and... uh, and then the entry into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. So Jesus boldly is going to Jerusalem. He's on a mission. His GPS is sending on the direct path, the quickest path to Jerusalem. And what is key here is that Jesus is in control of the situation. He knows where he is going, and he knows what is going to happen. And this is important. Sometimes we paint our Lord as a victim, as someone who has been delivered up, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All this is taking place because Jesus is in control of the situation. And if you want to read about that, you read about the arrest in the Garden of Gethsemane in the Gospel of John, It almost seems like a keystone cop situation where they're looking for Jesus. Jesus steps out of the out of the shadows and they they are so frightened that they fall over themselves. They're on the ground. Uh, So. They tried previously to capture Jesus. They couldn't. Now, Jesus is boldly going to Jerusalem. He knows why he's going there. He knows what's going to happen. He knows this is his mission. 
So approaching the Lord's passion, the mental state of the apostles, as we heard, amazed and afraid. And Jesus does not allay their fears. He simply explains the facts. This is the third time that St. Mark records that Jesus speaks about his passion. And he sets, he sets it out very, very clearly. He will be delivered to the chief priests and the scribes. They will condemn him to death. So here Jesus presents the role of the religious uh, aristocracy and religious leaders in, in, the in, his, in his crucifixion. This is not a commentary on all of Judaism. It's a commentary on the, uh, on the uh, leadership. They will deliver him to the Gentiles to add insult to what they already will do to him. They deliver him to the Gentiles, to the Romans. He describes the suffering and humiliation at the hands of the Gentiles. Not just a harsh, unjust death, but painful and degrading torture. Uh, Presbytera uh, Eugenia Vienia um, Constantino has a wonderful book on the uh on the crucifixion of christ i can't remember the the uh the the title right now it's put out by uh um ancient faith uh, look it up uh, it's on the other side of the room right now that i'm finishing up because i promised the presbytera read it give some beautiful insights so they're going to deliver jesus to an unjust painful and degrading torture they will mock him, they will spit upon him, and they will scourge him. Three types of, of contempt. Three types. Thank you, Noel. The crucifixion of the king of glory. Thank you. Noel from IOCN. Got my back. God bless you. Uh, they will mock him, spit upon him, and scourge him. Three forms of contempt. Irony, sarcasm, and bodily torment. This is what they are going to do to him. Jesus, they will kill him. He's right to the point here. This is the point. They're, they're going to kill him. Jesus reveals again his death to his amazed and frightened disciples. See how the church has selected this gospel lesson. The week before the entry into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday setting the stage for us to to be not only mentally prepared but spiritually prepared for what's about to happen as in other accounts of the telling of the passion there is a lapse of faith by the disciples a lack of understanding jesus is talking about arrest trial torture death and resurrection amazing things things that should seem so awesome and fantastic that the disciples should be trying to figure it all out. But no, we have that little break here with James and John. They're concerned about honor and status, and they argue among themselves. They are literally lost in all this. There's understanding, a misunderstanding, they don't know what they're asking for. They want greatness. They want places of honor. When they should have been pondering on what the Lord had said, thinking about his passion. They misunderstood his work, his mission, his sacrifice. And in a sense, they almost betray Christ in this thinking. They've been with him for three years, and they do not, do not get it. And we have to sometimes stop for a moment with ourselves how do we act as christians how do we uh work and uh function in our parishes is the main purpose of our involvement in the life of the church to to find the true christ and to experience his grace and forgiveness or do we get caught up in all these other things all the other work that needs to be done necessary things whether you're on philoptohus or in parish councils or or doing uh, uh, 
any type of, uh, of mission work and outreach, if you're doing philanthropy work, whatever it may be, if job one isn't for us to be focused on Christ, then sometimes we miss the boat. We get caught up in being busy and not choosing the good portion and listening to Jesus. We know the story. We've, especially us older people, we've experienced the story over and over and over again in Holy Week, over and over and over again. Do we really take to our hearts what Jesus is doing for us? Is his mission our mission? We need to think and pray about these things. Part of the focus of Great Lent. So the disciples want to sit at his right and left hand, James and John. They, they, they're they still thinking uh, that there is a... Uh, a big triumph that's going to happen here. And that Jesus is going to be this great leader, which he is, but not in the sense that they expect. They want to sit his right and left hand and rule over everything. But Jesus said to them, you do not know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or be baptized with the baptize, baptism with which I am baptized? And they said to him, we are able. And Jesus said to them, the cup, that you drink, you will drink. And with the baptism with which I'm baptized, you will be baptized. So they really don't get it. But Jesus is telling them, you're going to get it. Not in the way you think. In the Old Testament, the cup. And in the Old Baptism meant suffering. The cup is suffering. And the baptism is death. Jesus at Gethsemane. And he said, Abba, Father, all these things are possible to you. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but you will. The cup equals the martyr's death. Remove this cup to me. And everything that Jesus says to them is in the present tense. It has already begun. His and their martyrdom has already begun. Are you able to drink my drink? And drink the cup from which I'm drinking, etc. It's all in the present tense. It's taking place. It's in motion. Jesus will suffer a sacrificial death, as they will as well. Within all this, Jesus explains how they are, pro are properly to carry themselves, how they are supposed to live as future leaders of the church. And Jesus called to them and said to them, you know that those who are supposed to rule over the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great men exercise authority over them. But it shall not be among you. But whoever will be great among you must be your servant, and whoever will be first among you must be the slave of all. Do not be like them. You are my followers. You are called to service. You are to be servants, diakonos, diakoni, and slaves, vuli, to one another. Do not be like the other ones who are tyrants. He himself is the Messiah, came to serve us, and we too are called to serve. As Christians and members of the body of Christ, we are called to service, not to recognition, to sacrifice, not to reward, to giving and not for gain. To become Christ-like, not more worldly. This can only happen if we only, if we open our hearts to what the Lord does for us, what he describes in this gospel lesson. Again, this is the mindset that the church is giving us to enter into this last week of Lent and to participate in Holy Week. And in verse 45, for the Son of Man also came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus wants his disciples and he wants us to be like him. I serve, so shall you. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he'd emptied himself taking the form of a servant, 
being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even death on the cross. Philippians 2, 5 through 8. We've talked about this for, before, I think last, last week, and we'll talk about it again. This is such a significant uh, understanding of what Christ does for us. This self-emptying love, he emptied himself, taking the form of a servant. This kenosis, this kenotic and self-emptying love of God. He becomes our servant to lead us to salvation. He does it by becoming one of us. Through his humility, he becomes one of us. He endures all that he endures, and he dies upon the cross for us. He doesn't stop there. He descends into the realm of the dead. He literally dies. His soul and body are separated. His body is lying in the tomb, and his soul in hell, in Hades, not hell, Hades, preaching the good news. And he brings all to resurrection, all who chose to embrace his truth. Everyone who embraces the truth of Jesus Christ is resurrected with him. He himself is the servant. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, spitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, and the Lord has laid him on him the iniquity of us all. Isaiah 53, 3-6. Jesus comes to reconcile to, uh, God to us. It means to change or reestablish as in a broken friendship, to return to peace and communion, this reconciliation. Romans 5, 10 through 11. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. I mean, this is the work of Jesus Christ, what he does for us. What about us? 1 Corinthians 5, 18 through 20. All this is from God, who through Christ, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ God, was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on the behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God. As Christians, we are expected to embrace the fact that we are ransomed and reconciled to God. This is who we are as Christians, that our Lord has freed us from the bondage of sin, corruption, and death. That we can live with the hope of meaning in our life. And that we can have direction of knowing where to go in this life. And to know that we will be with Christ forever, life eternal. The passion that our Lord talks about today in this gospel lesson is about life in the kingdom of God. And we are called to be his ambassadors. We are called to declare the will of God and to announce what he is all about. So there we have the gospel lesson. Very, very, very powerful message. He lays it out there for us. Now, last week, I spoke a little bit about Hebrews. Gave it a, a little bit of a, a little background into it and talked about it. This, this week's epistle lesson, the Sunday's epistle lesson from Hebrews 9, 11 through 14. Uh, again, just amazing, amazing uh, teachings from, from St. Paul. He truly understands 
uh, things in a, in, a, in, a, in a depth that can be a bit intense. I'll use that word, a bit intense. But let me read uh, here chapter 9, verses 11 through 14. This will be the epistle lesson that will be read before the gospel lesson on Sunday the 21st. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, he entered once for all into the holy place, taking not the blood of goats and calves, but his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. For if the sprinkling of defiled persons with the blood of goats and bulls and with the ashes of a heifer sanctifies for the purification of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Okay? So, we already have the proclamation, if you will, of the third time Jesus speaks about his uh, his death and resurrection, his passion to uh, in front of his apostles. Now, St. Paul reflecting on what Jesus does for us and comparing it to the tradition, uh, the, the, the worship of the Jews. Uh, we take this in a little bit different direction. And we have to realize a couple of things here. First of all, that the early church, the nascent church, was at first very, very Jewish. The first converts, the apostles, the 5,000 people they converted on, on Pentecost, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, were not Gentiles like Paul did later. These were Jewish communities. And even when Paul went into a community, he would go to the synagogues and he would start preaching and teaching there. They understood certain aspects of their faith as Jews. And now Paul is here to show how Christ is the fulfillment of what they were practicing for so many years. So Christ came as the high priest of the good things to come. High priest of the good things that have come into being. Okay, The, the translation says, but Christ has come as the high priest of the good things to come. Probably a more accurate translation, translation is that he is the high priest of the good things that have come into being. That have come into being. That exist, in other words. Not an expectation that it's going to happen in the future. This is what already taken place. It makes sense because Paul's writing to a church after the resurrection of Christ, after the ascension, after Pentecost. So it's not so much that we are awaiting good things to come, but what we have now are the good things that have come into being. What are the good things? St. Paul does not lay them out or explain them, but we can begin to examine them because we kind of, we, we have a gut feeling, let's say. I have a great example. The life of St. Mary of Egypt. A truly broken and injured person. She had fallen into sin to the point to where she did not care. Sin was consuming her and destroying her and keeping her from God. We don't know what happened to this poor person, this poor young girl. But whatever happened to her caused her to lose all hope. She comes to Jerusalem with some pilgrims. More out of, uh, I don't know, some sort of, you know, curiosity for whatever reason. And she has a miraculous encounter with God. Some people will say that the, 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 the real miraculous aspect of this encounter was her inability to enter into the church in Jerusalem to venerate the cross. That some invisible power had kept her from it. But really, the greater miracle is her repentance and her healing. Having been so far from God after this encounter with the Holy, after this encounter with the high priest, 
of the good things that have come into being, it changes her radically. She flees to the Judean wilderness to spend the rest of her life in prayer and union with God. How she is able to do this is again by God's miraculous grace. How can such a sinner have such an amazing return to God? But as Paul says in Romans 5.20, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. The same is true for us as God touches our lives. He grants us the good things of his kingdom. So we have this amazing example. To me, just to, to imagine that yesterday we celebrated St. John of the Ladder, an amazing ascetic of the church. We don't get a lot of backstory on John, but we don't have this sense of him being a, a, a grievous sinner. Um, we do have his writings, and he has this amazing ability to, to teach other ascetics on how to ascend the spiritual life. And then we come back with St. Mary of Egypt, who, if you look at this in, in, in the context of the church, she's on par with St. John of the Latter, one of the greatest saints of the church. Now we have St. Mary of Egypt, someone who was a horrible sinner, Let's lay it out there. But someone who was an immensely repentant person. And she is celebrated for centuries and will be celebrated till the second coming of Christ as an example of repentance. St. Paul goes on to talk about what is taking place with this uh, good things that have come into being. In the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is not of this creation. He's talking about the kingdom of heaven. He entered the Holy of Holies once and for all. Not by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, having attained eternal redemption. So he talks, you know, he's describing the uh, what, what the Jews know about, what, what takes place in their temple. How uh, the priests would go there and make offerings with the blood of goats. Jesus does not enter into the temple in the Holy of Holies. He enters into the presence of his Father and our Father in the presence of God. And not yearly. He does it once and for all. Again, we're going to go back to Philippians. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. But he emptied himself Again, the kenosis, the kinetic love, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likes of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself, became obedient unto death, even death on the cross. He becomes our servant, if you will, to lead us to salvation. He, do he does it again by his humility and dying upon the cross, descending to the realm of the dead, being resurrected. He does not resurrect himself. The Father resurrects him from the dead. And those who choose to follow him are resurrected as well. Jesus becomes the ransom for our fallen state. And again, he reconciles us to God. This broken friendship, as we talked before in, in the gospel lesson, has been reestablished. He returns us to this peace and communion. And we read, again, Romans 5, 10 through 11. Jesus enters into the holy place on our behalf before God. He goes into this more perfect tabernacle. In other words, not made by hands, not of this creation. He is there on our behalf, having offered himself, and he mediates for us before God. It is his blood that gives us our redemption. And the Greek word, for redemption is litron. And if I remember correctly, the 
communion anthem for Pascha as Lithrosis. Uh, it's the, 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 the redemption. So Litron is the Greek noun, which means the price paid for the release of something held by another. another. Okay? So someone, like happened in the ancient world, I think it's, it's still practice study in the Middle East where people are captured, you have to pay a ransom. This is what Jesus did for us. He paid the ransom. The verb lithrosine is the act of paying such a ransom which liberates those who are held. What are we being ransomed from? Sin, death, and corruption. We are being literally liberated or ransomed from ourselves and our fallen human condition. St. Mary of Egypt was liberated from her sin. It freed her to become who God had intended her to be and who she truly wanted to be when she was freed from sin. She could see and understand her purpose in life once she was ransomed from these conditions from sin, corruption, and death. And she sees clearly, this is my path. This is who I'm supposed to be. I understand God. She's seen the light. She's experienced the life, the truth that is Jesus Christ. She becomes a saint, freed from the cares and hardships of this life. And if you look at her life, you would think, what are you, what are you talking about, Father Tom? Her life was full of hardships. She suffered in the desert. Her skin became like leather. She had very little food. She had communion only a couple times. But she was freed in that desert because she was not concerned about all these other things, all the other stuff that's around us. She was with God. This redemption is eternal. Unlike the Old Testament sin offering that needed to be offered yearly, and this is what distinguishes what humans can do, what we can offer, a temporary state at best, illustrates clearly what God can accomplish. What he does is eternal. It never goes away. It is ours now and forever. St. Mary's life was changed at the point of her repentance. God's forgiveness, redemption, his healing entered and became part of her being, part of who she is, part of her existence. St. Paul describes it in Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Jesus did this once and for all. Never again. He will never do this again. But it's a gift to all people. His work upon the cross still impacts us today. Still reaches out. Still heals our hearts. It still saves our souls. It redeems and re it cures and restores us. This is the amazing thing of what Christ has done for us. And he talked about the blood of goats and lambs and all this other and the sprinkling. Again, this is the work of Christ, his saving work, his blood. How much more will the Messiah's blood do? How much more will his sacrifice heal us? How much more holy, W-H-O-L-L-Y, and holy, H-O-L-Y, will he restore us? We are cleansed from dead works. Those efforts that are not based on a living faith, that are our sense of more obligation, those things are washed away. We already have a faith that transforms us and our souls and transfigures what we do as Christians. The work of Jesus Christ 
what Jesus does, as St. Paul ex ex explains here, is a moral transformation, an inward change. We have become new creations in Christ Jesus. The first and interchange that brings us into a deeper appreciation of who God is and what he has done for us. When that starts to begin to work in our hearts and souls, we see him, we see God in prayer and encounter him in our reading and in our study of scriptures. We see beyond the words and and beyond the prayers in that sense. He cleanses and purifies us. And when we go to confession, we experience not the shame of talking in front of the priest, but the release of the bondage of sin. He enters us when we receive Holy Communion. We feel his presence within us. And even more is needed, according to St. Maximus the Confessor. He says, theology without practice is a theology of demons. In other words, we must live the faith, walk the walk. We must live our faith each and every day. I was flying on Southwest Airlines once, and after we had landed and we were um, reaching the gate, the flight attendant announced that there was a 90-year-old man in the front of the plane who had just completed his first flight ever. And she then says, let's give a big round of applause for our pilot. 90 years old for somebody flew. It was a great show. Can you imagine going to a physician or getting into a jet and your doctor, your pilot telling you that he had studied and memorized everything there was to be in a doctor or everything there was about being a pilot, but had never flown, had never practiced medicine, but you're going to be the first? How would you feel? So it's not enough to know to have read and study, it's to live the faith. Again, St. Maximus the Confessor, do not say that you are the temple of the Lord, writes Jeremiah, nor should you say that faith in our Lord Jesus can save you, for this is impossible unless you also acquire love for him through your works. As for faith by itself, the devils also believe in trouble, James 2.19. So, in the gospel lesson, we are being prepared for what the Lord is doing for us. In Hebrews, Paul is telling us, this is what Jesus has done for you. And let's get down to the real practice of our Christian faith. The witness and example of St. Mary of Egypt on this Sunday is so important. Even though she was a monastic, a hermit, an ascetic, who lived in the wilderness by her alone, she impacted and has served countless number of people. Generations of Christians have been awed by her repentance and inspired by her holiness. The word spread about Mary of Egypt beyond her being in the desert, beyond um, her time still being felt today. She lived her faith in a heroic way her life as a saint is still a witness for us today wherefore seeing we also are encompassed about with a so great a cloud of witnesses let us lay aside every burden and the sin which doth easily beset us let us run with patience the race that has been set before us hebrews 12 1 inspired by people like saint mary of egypt her healing is an example for each and every one of us. Her restoration, her redemption, her elitrocene, her ransom, can become ours. She somehow comes to understand that Christ has come and has ransomed her from death and corruption. And having experienced this redemption, receiving this grace, 
from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. She's freed from herself and from her sin. Her former life is gone. Don't look back at what you've done. It's already passed. We don't know what the future will bring. What are you doing right now? I think that's the way St. Mary of Egypt lives her life. She wanted to be with God, so each and every moment she focused in on her relationship with Jesus Christ. She was free to look to God, to his grace, to his love, and to her salvation. Her life has become a life that overflows with meaning and liberty. She has become what God had intended for her and for each and every one of us to be. And her ascent to God is what Theosis is all about. One of the hymns that we will read on Saturday night, the Vespers, that will be chanted on Saturday night, Vespers, talks about her amazing turnaround. Having worshipped at all the holy places with great joy, you have received saving grace for the journey of virtue. And with all haste, you did set upon the good path you have chosen. Crossing the stream of Jordan with eagerness, you've gone to live in the dwelling place of the Baptist. You have tamed the savagery of the passions through your ascetic way of life. And boldly, you have broken the rebelliousness of the flesh, O Mother, ever glorious. What an amazing example of what St. Mary of Egypt has accomplished through the grace of God. As we close out, I just got a few little things I want to share with you. St. Theognostos says, Since salvation comes to you as a free gift, give thanks to God our Savior. If you wish to present him with gifts, gratefully offer from your widowed soul two tiny coins, humility and love. And God will accept these in the treasury of a salvation more gladly than the host of virtues deposited there by others. Grace, humility, and love. St. Elias the Presbyter writes, If you are concerned for your soul's health, do not despair of your sickness as though it were incurable, but apply to it potent medicine of ascetic effort, and you will get rid of it. Use the example of St. Mary of Egypt. Repent and focus on God. And he goes on to say that the king, the key to the kingdom of heaven is prayer. He who uses this key as he should sees what blessings the kingdom holds in store for those who love it. He who has no communion with the kingdom only gives attention to worldly matters. Again, the focus on prayer in the journey of great Lent. And the one quote that uh, that I love very much, and it's attributed to St. John of Chrysostom, St. John of Chrysostom, I don't know uh, exactly where he said it, if he said it, but it's still true. No one goes to hell for sinning. They go to hell for not repenting. This is the, uh, the last step, if you will, in, in our pilgrimage in preparation for Saturday of Lazarus and Palm Sunday is this image of St. Mary of Egypt coming to repentance, for repenting for whatever she had done, had done and focusing in on the message of Jesus Christ. I want to close with a few little thoughts that I gleaned from Father John Chrysavis' book on soul mending. He says that somehow we have been accustomed to thinking of repentance as an unpleasant, though necessary, and obligatory rejection of the sin we enjoy. That we have tended to lose sight of repentance as fundamentally joyous and a restorative return to life in its fullness. This is, again, the uh, image of St. Mary of Egypt. She's not looking back on her life saying, oh, gosh, i got to live all that, leave all that stuff behind. She's looking forward to a relationship with God, a God that frees her, a, a, a relationship that restores her, a relationship that renews her. She has become a new creation in Christ Jesus. 
all that stuff she did in the past was destructive and painful. All that is gone. He goes on to say that the primary orientation of repentance is not toward our past, but toward our future, which has become much, much brighter in the light of the divine mercy, forgiveness, and hope offered in Christ Jesus. I've used this quote many, many times. Philippians 3, 17, the thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. That we are straining to enter into the kingdom. St. John the Baptist and, and Matthew, repent for the kingdom of heaven is coming. Again, moving forward, moving closer, getting into this pilgrimage mode of moving towards Christ. And the last thing from Father Father John Chrysavis, repentance accordingly becomes not a repellent magnification of our deformity, but an attractive reflection of God's beauty. It is an invitation not to be hopeless, but to be with God. We don't look back at the things we've done wrong. We'll look forward to the glory that is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So as we uh, close out today on, uh, and we talk about the fifth Sunday of Great Lent, let us ask for the prayers of St. Mary of Egypt and her inspiration. Um, when you go to church on Sunday, think about her amazing journey, her amazing, amazing pilgrimage into a relationship with with God and how she becomes great because of repentance and humility and love and prayer. So much so that we celebrate her for what, 15, 16 centuries. What an amazing witness. So that will close out the Sundays of Great Lent. Next week, the plan is to spend Monday at 4 o'clock and Tuesday at 4 o'clock to do a review of the Saturday of Lazarus, Sunday, uh, the Palm Sunday, and uh, Monday we'll go probably through Wednesday, uh, the Wednesday Holy Unction service. So we're going to kind of do an overview of those services, what's being celebrated, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then on Tuesday next week, uh, we'll come back because it's just too much information, too much time to cover in just one hour. We'll try to quickly do from Wednesday evening, which is the Vespers of the uh, Last Supper, the Mystical, Mysticos, the Hypnos, the Mystical Supper, and do Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And then we will uh, uh, conclude this pilgrimage to Pascha. And the plan is um, on, I think it's going to be, May 13th, we will start a, a, a second part of our pilgrimage, if you will, that we will start uh, talking about uh, the Pentecostadian, the, the period of time from Pascha to Pentecost and uh, the meaning of those Sundays as well. So next Monday, we'll start on Holy Week, uh, conclude that on Tuesday. We will be very busy during the uh, Holy Week, we'll be focusing on the services, and then we'll have a little time after that, and we'll start back again. I pray that this has been a, a blessing to you, and may uh, may the uh, prayers and inspiration of St. Mary of Egypt be with you all. God bless you, and good afternoon.